first speaker is uh, uh, Chris, and he will speak about the Cairo Graphics Kit, getting modern graphics with familiar tools. He is from our new sponsor, NAM. And um, as I spoke so long, we will give him uh, 10 extra minutes and push things a little bit uh, that he won't be punished for me speaking long time. And I wish all of us a fun conference. Hello, everybody, and thank you all for coming here. I'm going to use this as my personal timer and give myself 45 minutes starting now. So when this beats, I'm done. Um, like Susan, I can talk on demand and I can talk forever about small talk and uh, particularly my favorite passion right now, which is Cairo. And for those of you that were at ESAG, I gave this talk uh, there. And so it's a little variation on that talk. Um, that talk was more about what it is. And what I got from a little bit of feedback was more emphasis on why. Um, it may not be apparent from the presentation, because there were some questions about why we took the route that we did, why maybe we didn't do you know, more cutting edge stuff. And uh, this presentation sort of aims to explain the constraints that we had to work in and the fact that we wanted modern graphics, but we wanted uh, to work with familiar tools. So that kind of implied that we were stuck or constrained within a particular environment. So, who am I? Uh, my name is Chris Thorberson, and I have the official title of Senior Staff Software Engineer at Lamb Research Corporation. Uh, I wear many hats. Um, I am sometimes the software PR guy for internal marketing. Um, I'm the liaison to the academic community. Uh, right now, we're working with Dr. Bergel. And uh, I also come and give uh, conference talks about what we do at Lamb. So, what does land research do? Uh, the official marketing blurb is that we are a major supplier of wafer fabrication equipment and services to the worldwide semiconductor industry. Uh, that might not mean a lot to people, but it breaks down to uh, IC components that are found inside things like cell phones, laptops, MacBook Pros, all those nice things. At some point in their life, they visited my machine. So if you're looking at your computer now, or you have a cell phone, there is an almost 100% chance that something inside that thing once took a tour through my machine. Um, we use Visual Work Smalltalk, and it is at the heart of our machine's control system. And that's important because what that means is that Small talk plays a part in just about everybody's life, whether they realize it or not. Um, it's kind of a few degrees of separation, but it's one thing to be able to say that you work with small talk, and then it's another thing to be able to say that, oh yes, small talk had a part in that device that you're using right now. Um, we have about 100 developers, and 20 of them are small talk developers. Uh, we have uh, product suite of about 39 different machines that we sell. And the company right now is at about 2,500 employees. Uh, we're going through a merger and acquisition right now with an equally sized company. And so by the end of June, it's likely that our company will be close to 5,000 employees with a software development team of about 300. And we anticipate doubling the size of the small talk team to about 40 small talk developers. Uh, it's a testament to the fact that we don't need that many small talk developers to get things done. Um, you know, as you can see, 100 developers are dedicated to other activities. 20 of those uh, developers concentrate on just the machine control aspect of, of our product. Line. So, this is what one of these things looks like. These are the machines. And they help to manufacture these, which get cut up and put into these. And these are the things that go into your cell phone and your computer and what's not. And so 
This thing here, this orange thing, uh, holds about 25 of these. So 25 per, and you can see on this machine there are three, we call these foops or bolts. And uh, this is where all the money is. Uh, so Intel, you know, if they're making Core i7s, there'll be a bunch of Core i7s on one of these wafers. Or if we're making flash memory, uh, there'll be a bunch of flash memory chips on one of these. So as these wafers, as we call them, as these wafers progress throughout the manufacturing process, their value starts to go up and up and up and up. Uh, typically, one of these may be, after it's finished production, $10,000 to $100,000, and that's times 25 times three. Um, so there's a lot of money traveling through these machines as we get further along in the manufacturing process. So we want to make sure that we have a control system that is as reliable as can be, because there's a lot at stake if something goes wrong, and that was part of why we chose Smalltalk, was because we could get it done with fewer people, it had a great history behind it, and you know we had visibility in all aspects of what this machine did. So that's why we chose to use small phone. Typical machine user interface. Uh, try to get past the fact that we're using the motif look and feel. Um, as we all know from small talk, that's just the click of a button to change look and feel. But customers actually have requested that we don't change look and feel. Uh, it's important for their operators to be able to navigate the software. They want, believe it or not, a familiar look and feel. It's one of the requirements when we sell equipment that we present the same style of user interface. Uh, it's also actually governed by standards. Uh, the semiconductor industry has a governing body called SEMI, and SEMI dictates that they want to have this portion uh, for all vendors of equipment to be the same, and this portion to be the same, and then this area here is sort of the playground or the canvas that is specific to the vendor. Another style of machine, uh, different model, but again, you can tell the same kind of user interface. And here are all the variations of machine that we sell. It's quite extensive, um, and there's a few that are missing. So, by a show of hands, who knows what Cairo is? I'm guessing a lot of people know what Cairo is. Okay, uh, well, I will then, since it's actually not as many as I thought, uh, this is a wholesale copy of the uh, Cairo website in terms of what Cairo is, so uh, I'll have to give credit to those guys, but it is an open source 2D graphics library with support for multiple output targets. Um, it's written in C, it's usually compiled as an external library, in our case uh, it's a DLL, and the currently supported output targets include X Windows, Quartz, Win32, uh, Image Buffers, which we use quite a bit, uh, PostScript, PDF, and SVG. Uh, thanks to the folks at Syncom, Travis, you get kudos here. Uh, they created a set of bindings that let us leverage the use of Cairo. So we didn't have to create any kind of binding. The bindings already existed when we decided to go the route of Cairo. And you can find these bindings uh, that are published as a package called Cairo Graphics in the Syncom Public Store. So, what is the CGK? Um, it's a collection of packages that further enhance the Cairo graphics and Tango packages that Syncom already provides. Um, it provides what we would call visual works proper, but Cairo based views, wrappers, controllers, some extensions, some utilities, and more importantly, some working examples. Um, if you use it for anything, it is a working example of what you can do with the Cairo bindings. If you don't use the CGK at all, but you're looking for a repository <coughs> of ways to use the Cairo bindings, then use this as an example of how to leverage Cairo in your environment if you're using visual books. Uh, we decided to give Cairo the Cairo graphics kit away. Uh, we're not in the business of selling graphics software, we're in the business of making semiconductor equipment. So we wanted to put the work out there for anybody to use. So you can download the Cairo Graphics Kit. Uh, it's a bundle that's free licensed under LGPL. And you can use it in 7.7, but we also maintain a branch for 7.4. And that part right there is sort of the heart of what I'm going to talk about. We don't get the luxury, unfortunately, of always jumping to the most cutting-edge version of Smalltalk. 
we are constrained by our customers, by our project managers, by our marketing people, that we can't always <coughs> make transitions. So it's important for us that Syncom provide tools that are backwards compatible. And uh, it took almost no work um, for us to get Cairo fit back into 7.4. And so we were able to go from 7.4 and utilize it right from the get-go. So what started it all? Um, well, we had a new machine design that was in the works. And the new machine design that we're talking about is this guy right here. Um, it had some special animation requirements that we didn't, couldn't handle uh, in, in our current framework. So the, the animation te technique used by our older framework wasn't going to work in, in this new uh, application. And try not to laugh too hard. Uh, as I'm about to show you, this is what we do uh, in our older framework. We would have this composite part, and what would happen is all possible animation images would reside in this dictionary, and that dictionary was held onto by the application model, and the events would drive animation. But what we would do is we would sequence the animation by actively replacing uh, images inside of this composite. So this sequence that you're about to see here is the sequence where this arm, this robotic arm, is going to make an extension move into this what we call chamber. Then it's going to retract and rotate and point to this chamber. And so what we would do is we would take image one and we would replace it by image two and we would replace it by image one and then back to image three. I mean, that is something that you would do maybe back in the 80s. Uh, it's not exactly cutting edge, but it worked, and it worked pretty well until we got to the point where now all of a sudden we needed continuous updates. We needed continuous rotation. So there's no way you're going to be able to handle an animation framework using this kind of methodology. So we looked around, and that's when we discovered, okay, we're going to need three simple things. We're going to need to work with some PNG images. We want to be able to transform those images in real time based on events coming in from our piece of uh, machinery. And these events are coming from all over the machine, so we want to be able to potentially animate anything that the machine's doing. And we want a decent anti-aliasing. If anything, I want a decent anti-aliasing. I could really live without these two things if I could just get decent anti-aliasing. And so we did some work. And we took our test PNG images. Now remember, keep in mind, I am constrained to Visual Work 7.4. So we had our test PNG image. We used the native PNG image reader in 7.4, and that's what we got. And then when we applied our 50 degree rotation, that's what we got. But using the bindings in Cairo, that's what we got. We were able to maintain transparency, so you can see this transparent grid behind here. And when we do the rotation, uh, everything rotates as expected. So we're really happy, because we get to stay in visual works, and we get to get the animation, uh, as we call it, the animation bling that we wanted. Uh, but again, keep in mind, we are limited to 7.4. So somebody asked the last presentation, why didn't you just go to 771? Because 771 takes care of the problem found in 7.4 with the PNG image reader. Rotation is there, and it functioned, but it didn't function quite the way we wanted to. If you noticed in that previous slide, there was those black uh, triangles that showed up. So it wasn't just that we could jump to 7.4. Again, we were constrained to, or we couldn't jump to 771. We were constrained to 74. So somebody asked in the last presentation, uh, all that CGK work for PNG images and rotation, you know, uh, that seems like a lot of things to do just for those two features. But we had another major sort of requirement, which is we have 20 other developers that we have to work with. And so those developers wanted to use Cairo capabilities, but they didn't want to use them at the binding level. Uh, they wanted to maintain familiar visual works tools and the familiar visual works experience. So they wanted tools like the UI Builder and the Painter. They were really looking for WYSIWYG. Uh, 
they wanted to incorporate familiar functions from vector pixel-based editing programs. A lot of our guys use Illustrator and Photoshop, so you know, they wanted a simple workflow. Uh, MVC, um, MVC reigns supreme in our framework. Uh, our framework is called ControlWorks, and ControlWorks is a whole other talk in and of itself. Uh, most of our GUIs are derived from the application model. Uh, we have approximately 60 GUI pages in our application, sometimes as many as 90, depending upon the tool. And so app model reigns supreme in our framework, which is, again, control There's many starting templates that we get to use. And from my point of view, I wanted to move away from pixel-based animation. I wanted to start going into vector-based animation just because it's a little bit faster and uh, I was getting tired of just drawing pictures of, of our tool. Uh, that has yet to be realized. So the first thing we needed to do was find out what was already there and then decide to build upon it. Uh, we weren't going to start from scratch. We really wanted to capitalize on what we found in VisualWorks. And we were trying to solve an animation problem, but we were constrained to make it work within the traditional VisualWorks framework. So that was important. So somebody took a look at the problem and they came back and they said, you know, a window spec looks a lot like a scene graph. And it wasn't immediately apparent, uh, because some of us didn't even know what a scene graph was, but when we sort of did some research, we found out that yes, uh, you know, you can actually make that comparison. The GUI framework has so much in common with the notion of a scene graph that we decided, you know, this is actually a pretty good fit for what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, the window spec could act as the static capture uh, of the intended scene, and the builder could turn that static capture of the scene into something that became active. So we were well on our way. Okay, high school teachers around the world are going to probably have their ears burn as I'm about to use Wikipedia as a source. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to, uh, because we all do it, whether we admit it. But if you look at Wikipedia's definition of a scene graph, the following components are going to need to be required. So we're going to need a tree structure. Uh, tree structures will have group nodes uh, and leaf nodes. And it finds out, in our case, uh, group nodes are already front and center in the VisualWorks uh, hierarchy for GUIs. They're called composites. I came along and through the CGK I added this thing called a transform wrapper and this thing called a tweening wrapper. Um, leaf nodes. Uh, again, leaf nodes are front and center already. Uh, views are considered by the definition of a leaf node. Uh, views fill that, that role. And then uh, any kind of decorator wrapper, so anything that maybe uh, adds drop shadow, uh, anything that changes the, the rendered output. Uh, tree traversal. Uh, well, it turns out that the damage repair policy is a perfect example of tree traversal. Damage repair goes up the tree, and then, of course, for those of you familiar with the visual works, uh, refresh mechanism display on to versus back down the tree. So I'm putting check boxes across all this stuff realizing that yay, I, I'm going to be able to do this. Um, and then we get on to some of the more abstract ideas like bounding volume hierarchies. Um, again, if you're familiar with the visual works notion of uh, visual parts or visual components, then each of those have their own notion of bounds. Um, and so bounds are a collection of either their, their own bounds or a combination of, of, of their children's bounds. And then spatial partitioning. Uh, the layout wrapper holds on to the static spatial information that uh, the layout engine needs to, to do it. So everything was there. I had everything necessary to, to implement the scene graph. And it was sort of one of those aha moments where we're, we thought to ourselves, wow, VisualWorks has always represented a GUI as a scene graph. And so it was a natural fit that we could just go into that mode. So knowing that we wanted to stay with what we knew, we wanted to stay with the UI Painter. Uh, UI Painter lets us break down the process of creating an animation overview into the same process as making a GUI. So I had a bunch of guys who already know how to make uh, main user, you know, main UIs through the GUI Builder tool. So why should making an animation really be any different? Everything's already there, uh, and so we just needed to capitalize on that. So it provides the WYSIWYG functions that we, you know, that we wanted. And I'm going to show you. Um, what I mean by that. 
notice here that there are a bunch of uh, labeled Cairo components. So these components are, again, visual works proper. Uh, they follow the visual works protocol, but they use Cairo to render themselves. But they're available in the familiar UI builder framework. Um, so if somebody drops a particular component down, all the standard tools that they're used to show up um, and I don't have to train them on how to do anything differently. So we're good in that regard. So we got the WYSIWYG functions that we wanted. Uh, UI Painter had some of the features found in graphics editing tools that I was familiar with. And so for me, it was the logical place to extend the environment to include more tools, more trackers, more functionality that mimic the process of what I was used to in a package like Corel or Illustrator or Photoshop. Another thing that we wanted to stick with, uh, which I know is a, is a controversial one, uh, even within our own group, this is discussed quite heavily, which is the use of MVC. Um, the GUI part of our framework still relies heavily on MVC. So the CGK components needed to follow that same design pattern. Uh, now is not the time for me to try something completely new. Uh, I had to constrain myself to make sure that these new components follow the MVC design pattern. Uh, in the beginning, uh, a lot of the work was more like MV than it was MVC, um, because a lot of the views did not have runtime controllers. They had design time controllers incorporated as painter uh, trackers, but once you use them in a runtime environment, they were pretty much uh, static. Uh, Cairo Action Button View and Dendrogram View have controllers, but they're not exploiting any particular behavior of Cairo. They are really capitalizing on existing controller technology that's found in visual tools. And most of the work uh, that we do in terms of controllers is around extending or subclassing UI painters. Uh, I do categorize that kind of work as still controller work because it's adding a, a tracker to the UI Painter controller. So that was a, a fair chunk. Um, they, again, as I mentioned earlier, they play an important role in mimicking the workflow of a package like Illustrator or Corel. Uh, we have one guy who does quite a lot of the Cairo stuff, and it's easy for me to tell him. Um, in fact, he knows all the hotkeys and he knows what the controllers do because we purposely mimicked the Illustrator workflow in the UI Painter tool. So if you know the hotkeys and if you know the way uh, that drag handles are displayed in Illustrator, we mimic that behavior in, uh, in, in the CGK. So staying with what we know, uh, again, wrappers, uh, also very controversial. I make this almost every day with one of the more senior visual works guys. Uh, but again, if widgets were going to be visual works proper, then they would need to uh, understand how the visual works wrapping process works. Uh, so it had to work the same way. And uh, you know, the UI, for those of you who are familiar with the, the UI building process, uh, the component spec plays a large part. Uh, Cairo-based components interact with their wrappers more than their visual works counterpart. That's probably where I broke the traditional behavior. Um, spec wrappers, transform wrappers, and layout wrappers are all sort of intimately tied back to the view. And there's a particular reason why I have to do that. I'll try to show why. Um, so, Cairo-based views, uh, they generally subclass from Cairo simple view, which subclasses from simple view, which is a visual uh, Any Cairo-based view can always get to its spec wrapper. Uh, I found that to be pretty important was because the spec wrapper holds on to the DNA of the component. Uh, it's the spec wrapper that's used during the building process. And so I wanted to make sure that I could manipulate my own DNA. Um, the European community might not like that because we would consider that genetically modified, but we're okay there. Uh, so yes, I modify my DNA quite frequently. Um, any Cairo-based view can always get to its transform wrapper. In 
the transform wrapper is something new that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but it's an integral part of the Cairo Graphics Kit, and it's what gives most views their ability to scale, rotate, and translate. And any Cairo based view or subclass of digital part implements a double dispatch approach to the display on method. Uh, it's very likely that you will be, if you're using the visual inspector tools, that you will be able to throw a visual component or a wrapper a screen graphics context instead of a Cairo context. So depending upon what level of the visual hierarchy you're looking at, I need to be able to deal with both types of contexts. And I don't want to do constant comparison where I do something like is kind of and then take a direction from there. I'll let the screen graphics context tell me what rendering method to use. And so we take a double dispatch approach to that. So finally, the Affine Transform and its role in the Cairo Graphics Kit. Um, it was so important that it got its own wrapper. And I would have to say that the Transform wrapper is probably at the heart of the Cairo Graphics Kit. If there was anything that I, that I kept if I redid this, it would be the Transform wrapper because I think that's where a lot of the power is. That's really what gives me that ability to do scene graph type comparison. And I'll show you a, a demo of why. Um, it, again, as I mentioned before, provides the CPK view with its full range of transform capabilities. So the views can be rotated, scaled, translated during runtime or during canvas editing. Transform wrappers also act as a composite container so that allows you to apply a single transform to multiple components within the GUI. So you can start building up sort of kinematic type uh, animations using a nested transform. Uh, transform wrappers also understand how to translate point objects in and out of their coordinate space no matter how deeply they're nested. And so that's important for controllers because if your widget scales, you know, if it's smaller or larger, if it's rotated, and you put your mouse on that particular view or the component inside the view, then you're going to want to make sure that that mouse point is properly translated as it traverses down the container hierarchy. And so the transform wrapper takes care of doing that translation. Uh, controllers that interact with the transform wrapper don't need to worry about mouse point translation. Uh, the wrapper will take care of that for them. And it takes care of them uh, through very, very similar APIs that uh, uh, contains point, uh, if anyone's ever seen that method, um, that's the standard API method uh, that you're going to use to, to, to lock in or, or enter into the transform wrapper. And the transform wrappers maintain their own damage repair policy. Uh, that was important for us because you couldn't necessarily use just a fixed rectangle. If your view was scaled down, the damage repair rectangle may initiate from a low level component within the tree, but as it traverses up the visual hierarchy, it may grow, rotate, turn. And so we found that in order to use the standard visual works repair or damage repair policy, that uh, that transform wrapper had to manipulate the damage repair rectangle on the fly, depending upon what kind of transform was applied. So it maintains its own damage repair policy. And we have two different set of predominant. We have sort of an accumulated damage policy where after there's a certain percentage of damage, we'll go ahead and, and redraw. Or we may do just an immediate damage. Uh, so if you get a damage repair rectangle, boom, go ahead and do the redraw. So it depends on, uh, on what we're doing and how quickly it will make it. OK, before I conclude, I'll show you the things that we might have to do. So here's a, a typical workflow in, well, here, let's do this. So here's a window spec for one of my machines. And this is a canvas. This is a standard issue visual works canvas. We look at uh, if we look at the painter hierarchy, here's that scene graph that I'm talking about, where I have group nodes, and in this case, this particular. 
particular transform wrapper is being used for the function of scale only. So if the window size changes, anybody contained inside of this tree will get the same scale applied to it. So just like that, I get automatic scaling of everybody inside of this transform. So the window tells the transform I am a different size. The transform then calculates what scale to apply to the entire tree um, of components. Here is where I'm using the transform to group uh, motion. So in this case, let's say I have this thing called the carrier group. Is a limitation on the maximum value. 
do that for components like a, we have a gauge component where we have a picture of a, you know, a graduated scale and then a little picture of a needle. Now that little picture of the needle can rotate back and forth uh, along the scale, but technically it can rotate 360 degrees. And if I have some kind of input field below that needle, I don't want the needle to rotate all the way around and include the needle field. Now I might protect against that in my application model by preventing it from rotating uh, to, to an angle beyond what I want. But another way to guarantee that I won't ever occlude um, another visual works widget is to just constrain the area that it's allowed to render itself in. So uh, the transform wrapper is where that changes. Uh, the system's flexible enough that uh, we can continue on. Uh, but immediately we have, uh, in the vision of trying to get to the vector side of things, uh, we want to introduce a new view called vector shape, 
vector shape is just simply a visualization of the existing geometric classes that exist in, uh, in, in sitcom small talk. So if you design a Bezier curve and that's an instance of the geometric, then I want you to be able to just say visualize in the Cairo context and boom, uh, that information will be used to tell Cairo how to draw the Bezier curve. Uh, we're working on something called the PNID toolkit. PNIDs are plumbing and instrumentation diagrams. They're the, you know, in Hollywood when you see those guys standing in front of the big board of pipes and valves and all that kind of stuff, they're called PNID diagrams. Our tool is full of that kind of information. So we have lots of complex plumbing and tanks and gases. And right now we want a really simple way for developers to be able to build that PNID diagram. And again, we can get that with, uh, with Cairo. So we have a, a toolkit that we maintain that just lets them pull from a palette pictures of pipes, valves, tanks. Um, they can dynamically stretch them. They can fill them with patterns that indicate you know, what kind of EDO or gas is flowing through and it all just sits on top of uh, the standard NCC technology. Uh, UI painter slices, uh, that's a sore point. Uh, the thing I usually dread the most when we're creating a new view is the fact that I have to create a bunch of painter slices to let you configure that view. Um, so we've decided that we're gonna replace the color and pattern slice with a new unified fill stroke um, slice because in Cairo, uh, a fill and a stroke are pretty much one and the same. Um, you can use a fill, you can fill uh, something, you can fill with a gradient, you can fill with a pattern, you can fill with a solid color, and strokes are the same way. Uh, it, it makes no differentiation. So I want uh, to have a single slice that gives you colors, patterns, and gradients in, in a single unified space. And then something we're trying to do is what we're calling internally the app model view. The app model view is sort of our answer to the pain of building a view. Um, when we build views, we have to not only build views, but we also have to build specs, we have to build controllers, and we have to build painter slices to configure all those. And so we want to kind of streamline that process. Uh, we reuse a lot of our application models and sub canvases, and so my thought is, why can't you just turn an app model into a widget? Uh, we want to automate that process so that the app model shows up with an image on the painter on the, on the palette, and then you can just drag that app model onto the canvas. And then configuration will be a lot like the Microsoft uh, you know, grid view where you can just configure various aspects of the app model through a single slice. And we've actually gotten pretty, pretty close to finishing that up. So that's about it for me. Um, are there any questions? Good. Yes. Right, uh, VisualWorks does not let you by, in 7.4 anyway, uh, you cannot group a, a selection of components and then apply any kind of notation to that. And what is the tweening wrapper? Tweening wrapper, tweening is an animation, uh, it's a, a, a word for in between. Um, so if you define, uh, in, in animation world, the, the master animator would give the keyframe animators, he would give them the picture of Mickey Mouse over here and over here. And then the, uh, the junior animators would be responsible for filling in between. And so the term tweening was coined where you are starting with a beginning and end point, but the tweening wrapper will take care of filling in in between. And so in my case, uh, we have uh, animation components that I want to be able to define a starting and end position, but I want the <coughs> tweening wrapper to take care of actually moving it. And so what happens is the tweening wrapper actually holds on to a block closure, and that block closure is the nugget of information about how to get the, the two components to, to go from here to here. And the tweening wrapper may be a simple linear uh, movement, or it could be a you know, a bouncing ball kind of movement. But from the developer's point of view, he only has to define the starting and ending point. I don't know. <laughs>
said you had 39 different machines. Yep. Why? One per chip, one per uh, uh, CPUs, one for memory chips? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, customers buy different types of platforms for different applications. So if you're uh, etching logic, you know, logic would be CPUs, then they may have a particular type of machine. Uh, if you're etching NAND flash, uh, again, then that's a different kind of machine. Uh, oh, that's my time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. And while uh, Arden and Dirk are setting up, I have to make uh, an announcement because we are 15 minutes behind the schedule. Individual components separately, I apply a transform to all of those components and they all pick it up. Uh, at any level, though, I can ask the builder for the individual component and apply a separate transform. is a limitation 
outside of that bounding area, I'm just going to clip it. Uh, we do that for components like a, we have a gauge component where we have a picture of a, you know, a graduated scale and then a little picture of a needle. Now that little picture of the needle can rotate back and forth uh, along the scale, but technically it can rotate 360 degrees. And if I have some kind of input field below that needle, I don't want the needle to rotate all the way around and include the input field. Now I might protect against that in my application model by preventing it from rotating uh, to, to an angle beyond what I want. But another way to guarantee that I won't ever occlude um, another visual works widget is to just constrain the area that it's allowed to render itself in. So uh, the transform wrapper is where that uh, functionality lives. Let's see. changes. Uh, the system is flexible enough that uh, we can continue on. Uh, but immediately we have uh, in the vision of trying to get to the vector side of things, uh, we want to introduce a new view called vector shape. 
vector shape is just simply a visualization of the existing geometric classes that exist in, uh, in, in sitcom small talk. So if you design a Bezier curve and that's an instance of the geometric, then I want you to be able to just say visualize in the Cairo context and boom, uh, that information will be used to tell Cairo how to draw the Bezier curve. Uh, we're working on something called the PNID toolkit. PNIDs are plumbing and instrumentation diagrams. They're the, you know, in Hollywood when you see those guys standing in front of the big board of pipes and valves and all that kind of stuff, they're called PNID diagrams. Our tool is full of that kind of information. So we have lots of complex plumbing and tanks and gases. And right now we want a really simple way for developers to be able to build that PNID diagram. And again, we can get that with, uh, with Cairo. So we have a, a toolkit that we maintain that just lets them pull from a palette pictures of pipes, valves, tanks. Um, they can dynamically stretch them. They can fill them with patterns that indicate you know, what kind of media or gas is flowing through and it all just sits on top of uh, the standard MTC technology. Uh, UI painter slices, uh, that's a sore point. Uh, the thing I usually dread the most when we're creating a new view is the fact that I have to create a bunch of painter slices to let you configure that view. Um, so we've decided that we're gonna replace the color and pattern slice with a new unified fill stroke um, slice because in Cairo, uh, a fill and a stroke are pretty much one and the same. Um, you can use a fill, you can fill uh, something, you can fill with a gradient, you can fill with a pattern, you can fill with a solid color, and strokes are the same way. Uh, it, it makes no differentiation. So I want uh, to have a single slice that gives you colors, patterns, and gradients in, in a single unified space. And then something we're trying to do is what we're calling internally the app model view. And the app model view is sort of our answer to the pain of building a view. Um, when we build views, we have to not only build views, but we also have to build specs, we have to build controllers, and we have to build painter slices to configure all those. And so we want to kind of streamline that process. Uh, we reuse a lot of our application models in sub canvases. And so my thought is, why can't you just turn an app model into a widget? Uh, we want to automate that process so that the app model shows up with an image on pagers on the, on the palette, and then you can just drag that app model onto the canvas. And then configuration will be a lot like the Microsoft uh, you know, grid view where you can just configure various aspects of the app model through a single slice. And we've actually gotten pretty, pretty close to finishing that up. So that's about it for me. Um, are there any questions? Good. Yes. Right, uh, Visual Works does not let you by in 7.4 anyway. Uh, you cannot group a, a selection of components and then apply any kind of rotation to that. And what is the tweeting wrapper? Tweeting wrapper. Tweeting is an animation. Uh, it's a, a, a word for in between. Um, so if you define uh, in, in animation world, the the master animator would give the keyframe animators, he would give them the picture of Mickey Mouse over here and over here. And then the, uh, the junior animators would be responsible for filling in between. And so the term tweening was coined where you are starting with a beginning and end point, but the tweening wrapper will take care of filling in in between. And so in my case, uh, we have uh, animation components that I want to be able to define a starting and end position, but I want the <coughs> tweening wrapper to take care of actually moving it. And so what happens is the tweening wrapper actually holds on to a block closure, and that block closure is the nugget of information about how to get the, the two components to, to go from here to here. And the tweening wrapper may be a simple linear uh, movement, or it could be a, you know, a bouncing ball kind of but from the developer's point of view, he only has to define the starting and ending point. I don't know. <laughs>
you said you had 39 different machines. Yep. Why? One per chip, one per uh, uh, CPUs, one for memory chips? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, customers buy different types of platforms for different applications. So if you're uh, etching logic, you know, logic would be CPUs, then they may have a particular type of machine. Uh, if you're etching NAND flash, uh, again, then that's a different kind of machine. Uh, oh, that's my time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. And while uh, Arden and Dirk are setting up, I have to make uh, an announcement because we are 15 minutes behind the schedule.